this questioning of objective truth and how to figure out exactly how the world works and these universal laws that apply to uh, everything at all times and all places at all speeds in the universe, uh, that whole classical Newtonian me me uh, mechanic uh, and, and, and use of rationality to, to, to figure those things out, not only are they going to question that philosophically and psychologically and discredit it, you know, with Nietzsche and, uh, and, and Freud, like we talked about earlier, but they're going to do it scientifically too. They're going to figure out actually Newton and, and Maxwell and others. Uh, you've made some wonderful discoveries about the uh, world that we inhabit <clears throat> at our speed and size and all of that. Um, and those are consistent and usable and uh, useful. But uh, you are incorrect that these facts about size and acceleration and time and length and all of that, uh, those are not objective. Those are also subjective. I'm talking about actually how fast something is going or at least uh, how, f how quickly time and sp uh, is moving to the person, how long objects are, and uh, what of course it means to, to be real and, and, ha and what matter actually is. Those are gonna be completely, uh, our ideas about them are gonna be completely dismantled. And again, the, the things that we talked about before are still true uh, for us here uh, in, in our plane of reality at our speed and our size. But what they're gonna find out is when you go to the extremes of the universe, the most fundamental laws are actually not objectively true. Uh, they are subjective to the uh, perspective of the observer. And let's what let's let's find out what I'm what I'm talking about. So, the first clue they had to uh, their um, understanding that the first clue they had that their understanding wasn't complete or correct was uh, a development in science known as the ultraviolet catastrophe. All right, so we have Maxwell and Newton and, and others establishing these fundamental laws about gravity and electromagnetism and all that. Uh, and that was wonderful, and they thought they were on their way to figuring it out, and they thought the physics field itself was kind of, uh, you know, winding down, and you should look into other fields if you want to continue research and find interesting things. But boy, were they wrong. Uh, they had one little thing they had left to uh, explain. So they already uh, asserted, so again, classical mechanics here. Uh, they'd already asserted several things that they believed were true, that you know, atoms were those fundamental particles, that Newton's laws uh, were universal. Laws, universal, particles. Uh, and they had figured out electromagnetism and the spectrum. So they figured out exactly what um, electricity was, what light was, and in fact, uh, it's just light waves are actually just electromagnetic waves. And, magnetism oscillates with electricity and they're intertwined and that's how we can produce electricity and that's how all visible light works and uh, the, the color gradients are based on the wavelengths of these electromagnetic um, waves. So uh, here's what they were thinking. Uh, so here's a graph. The way it works as far as um, electromagnetic spectrum goes is there's only a a small range of electromagnetic waves we can see. That's visible light. So the colors you can see on the, on the rainbow, including white and black and brown and all of those on the, uh, and all the colors of that rainbow, uh, that's the visible light that we can see. And that's one specific wavelength of the electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum. Whoa, I can't say anything. Electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, and a wavelength is the length of a particular wave. So if I have a point A here and point B, uh, the wavelength is uh, the measurement of a wave. So this is one of the waves in the electromagnetic spectrum. It's the distance between these two waves, the, the, uh, the peaks and the valleys, how far away that is. And it's fixed. Electromagnetic waves, are they're going to figure out, are, are fixed. They're going to be the same. Uh, so that's one wavelength. Let's say that was like, I don't know, four inches. All right, that's the wavelength of that wave. Uh, and if I took a different wave, this is easier than a big one. Uh, that wavelength is actually smaller, and that actually fits too. So if I take this point to this point, or this point to this point, uh, it's going to be a smaller number. That'd be probably more like two inches. So uh, wavelength one was four inches. Wavelength two was two inches, and that's how you actually see the different colors. Because the way this would resonate is, oh, the bigger wavelength that's going to be like a red, and the uh, shorter wavelength, let's say that's that's a yellow. 
and that's kind of how it works. So all waves that are that wavelength appear to me as yellow. All wavelengths that are that length uh, appear to me as red, and that's kind of how it works. So those aren't the specific numbers, by the way, but that's what a wavelength is, that's what I'm talking about. There's a shorter uh, uh, wavelength or smaller wavelength means there's more little waves in between two degree points, and a longer or larger wavelength means there's less waves between two given points. So this would be a really large wavelength compared to these. You'd have to extend it into another uh, point to see. All right, so that's what I mean by wavelength. So um, here's the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, what we have at the very end here are what we call cosmic rays. I'm not sure how aware of those they were yet, but cosmic rays, gamma rays, um, they have x-rays, they have ultraviolet rays, so those are all different wavelengths. Uh, and then we're getting what we actually know here. Uh, this is where you get the visible light portion, visible light. So it'd be somewhere in this region. So uh, as we go down, then you have infrared, then you have microwaves, uh, and then you have various radio waves. Uh, and it keeps going. Uh, and the way this works is as we go this way, there, there's a, a higher frequency, or the wavelength is shorter. So there's more waves in a, in a, between a given point. So here, radio waves, those are like super long waves. The wavelengths on these are like, uh, they can be measured in kilometers or miles of that. They're that big, or at least meters. I don't know the exact measure. But uh, the visible light is much shorter. Then you get down to the gamma ray, uh, the cosmic ray, or x-ray down, they're much, much shorter. And what that represents is, um, the more waves you have, the, the more energy uh, that represents. And it's just like if you were to take a rope, right? If you got person A, person B, and you had a jump rope, right? It's just laying flat. If you wanted to make just one wave, that wouldn't take much energy. You just go, whoop, whoop, and that's all you'd have to do, <clears throat> right? And then that would go, it would slosh along, uh, and there it would go. It would be one big wave. And that takes very little energy. It's, it's much the same here. If you wanted to make a whole bunch of little waves like this between you and the partner, you just do a bunch of quick little uh, 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 jerks on the rope, right? And that requires, and you can even feel it, it requires more energy and effort. Uh, you'll get tired quicker and sweat and be short of breath much quicker doing a, a, a jump rope really up and down really quickly as opposed to one that was just uh, casual and, and large. So it works the same way here. So these wavelengths uh, have less energy, these wavelengths have more, all right? Uh, so they thought that, oh, okay, that's easy enough. <clears throat> so uh, as you uh, move down the spectrum, uh, it has more energy. Okay, we get that. But what should happen, if this is true, and that's the way it works, and, and energy can be any wavelength uh, on the spectrum, uh, and that just represents energy, then uh, if I looked at what's called a uh, black body, and I don't mean, by the way, like, actual black or skin or anything, uh, a black body, um, is it called object? A black body light source, or black body radiation, there we go, that's what it's called. Radiation, by the way, just means what's being emitted out as energy or light. <clears throat> um, so, when, when you're radiating heat, that's when you can like actually feel heat coming off of yourself because you're actually releasing uh, heat energy. Uh, when they look at black body uh, radiation, which, so it should be a source that has all of these spectrums, essentially, um, like the sun. The sun has almost all of these light forms coming out of it in some way, shape, or form. Uh, you should, since it could be any wavelength, you should just see uh, a somewhat equal amount of all of them as far as numbers. So if I looked at the sun, which is the closest thing we have to black body radiation, which, which should be able to show all uh, forms of, or, or various uh, levels of energy. Um, so if I was counting the number I, of waves I found here, this is like 10, 20, 30, 40, whatever it would be, actually be, I should see an equal amount of them if, uh, if they can be any, any wavelength uh, coming out, right? There shouldn't be any blips here. What they found is even with the sun, that wasn't the case. I didn't see every single possibility uh, on the spectrum. They were like blips in it, like actual dark spots. So if I like took all the light from the sun, um, it wasn't just a bar of every color or every wavelength. Uh, it was actually specific sections uh, that would come in. So that puzzled them. And they sort of explained, explained that as, okay, it's just because it's behaving as a wave. Um, but when they would measure the intensity of these, these rays, 
uh, they didn't get this straight line like they expected, uh, an equal amount. They always got uh, a weird distribution, which was kind of which is kind of like a bell curve. So, if they had really intense light, like a really lot of shining light, or a medium amount, or a low amount, uh, the curves always looked like this. So this would be like a low amount. It would look something like this, and then drop off. Um, and then that would be like medium. A low amount would be like this, and a high amount would, would be like this. Uh, and they were confused. Actually, move this over a little too far. Let me move UV over, make visible light bigger. There we go. UV, gamma, X-ray. Uh, that shouldn't have happened. What you should have seen was either an equal amount of them, or it, let's say it picked up an intensity with uh, the wavelengths, it should continue uh, up infinitely. So the, uh, the the higher the source or intensity, uh, you should just it should be going upward with the intensity of the energy. This they should have seen, but they didn't. What they observed was uh, this at ultraviolet, it would drop off substantially, uh, and that made no sense to them whatsoever. And that's what they call it the catastrophe because it ruined their um, uh, theories essentially. But also, by the way, if it did continue upwards. Every time you uh, uh, were exposed to any UV uh, light or anything like that, like the sun, for example, uh, you would just be scorched and burnt uh, immediately because the energy would be too high. So they were confused by that. So on the spectrum, oh, I forgot to mention, by the way, this is where red visible light would be. Over here would be violet or purple. Uh, in the middle, of course, would be yellow. Uh, and that's how the visible light spectrum works. But they were confused as to why this was the result and not some graph that continues upward uh, in intensity was which is what it should have been if they were correct that energy could be, or electromagnetic uh, waves could be any, any wavelength and any uh, range of intensity. So to explain this because they couldn't, they just could not come up with an explanation for this at all. So somebody randomly took a guess and they decided, well, the reason why we have so many of these specific waves and not very many radio waves and not very many cosmic or gamma or, or ultraviolet or x-rays is because uh, there aren't that many of them. Um, and they're like, well, duh, that's what we can see. But he, uh, he being a guy named Max Planck in 1901, and by the way, he just basically took a wild, not a wild guess, but he picked something, invented it because it fit what they found. And by the way, his, his finding does match what they find. If you plug in uh, his constant, uh, his, his theory here, uh, it, it, the, the bar actually matches uh, what, what we actually observe. So what he says is, okay, um, elect energy itself and, and, and electromagnetic waves and light rays, uh, they are not, uh, pop, not any possible uh, combination or amount, amount slash combo, uh, but rather uh, light and energy are quantized. Say like light is quantized. What does that mean? That means it can't be anything. It can only be a specific amount, like it comes in packages. And you're probably like, I don't, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, here's what it means. Um, there's no such thing as a, a like between wavelength. Like it can't be any uh, wavelength. Only a specific wavelength uh, can exist and it jumps directly to that. So what that meant was um, light and then by extension energy later uh, can only exist at specific values. Like it's not a true spectrum. I mean, it is a spectrum in that, you know, the numbers change and it goes and it varies uh, <clears throat> based on their energy levels, but you can't just jump between them. It can't be any possibility. Uh, the specific form of energy has to be a specific wavelength. <clears throat> Uh, or it doesn't exist. It can only be uh, one, two, three, all the way up. It's gotta be a whole number, an integer, or it can't exist. Uh, and that actually does provide an explanation for as to why there are those gaps um, uh, in the spectrum. And it also provides an explanation as to why the curve looks the way it does. Uh, so the reason why we don't see many cosmic gamma uh, or UV rays, uh, or going to the other end of the spectrum, infrared, microwave, and downward, is because there aren't that many specific packets of, of energy available that we can observe. We observe way more visible light uh, and others because there's just more of them floating around or bouncing around, not because it can be any possibility. All right, so that was really abstract. 
Uh, nobody could prove it. Uh, so he was like, well, it fits our explanation, but I don't even know if it's actually true. Uh, and that continued for a while, but this guy you've definitely heard of. Uh, so he's kind of what you would, I guess, credit with the uh, beginnings of uh, quantum theory. Uh, or even you say quantum mechanics, I guess, but certainly uh, quantum theory. <clears throat> so he, he's like, all right, well, maybe, maybe energy and light actually come in packets. It can't just be any wave. Like, it has to be a specific one uh, or it doesn't exist. And that's why we see specific amounts of them. All right, fair enough. Uh, but uh, no one could prove it, including him. He's like, maybe it's wrong, but it, but it fits. It works our explanation. And the math matches up, too, by the way. So when they punch these numbers in with his equation and his constant um, uh, mathematically, the equations matched up. It matched the way we observe light. So they were like, well, clearly it works, but like how and why? So the person that comes along four or five years later <clears throat> is a guy who I'm sure you've all heard of named Albert Einstein. And he's going to uh, publish uh, at least three papers that are going to absolutely change the way we understand science and reality uh, in, in many ways. So we'll talk about just three of them specifically, though. So let's talk about the first one since we're on this topic here of, um, of quantized theory, because he is going to be the one that's going to kind of officially... Uh, and again, his theories weren't just random. They weren't just like trying to plug in an answer and, and it works and it just happens to fit. Uh, his are actually based from the start on his idea of, of light and energy being quantized. And then uh, he's going to prove them mathematically as well. And when we go to test them in the future with, with our improved in instruments and technology, we're going to confirm these as well. So the stuff I'm going to tell you isn't just like theory that abstract theory that we can't test and observe. We've actually tested and observed these theories. So uh, know that going forward. So first one, since we're talking about uh, light here. So according to that, I correctly put this up here for classic mechanics, they believe that light uh, was, uh, was wave-like, was a wave. And they had plenty of experiments to conduct and show that, like the two-slit experiment, which shows that uh, the way that light distributes it actually does form wave-like patterns. Um, so they were able to confirm that with several experiments. But Einstein's gonna be like, actually, no, light, isn't a um, wave specifically. It is a particle. Uh, in fact, it's actually both. Uh, he's going to assert a couple things. He's going to, of course, according to this quantized theory that energy comes in fixed packets, like there's no in-between energy. It's either you are this form of energy, this wavelength, or you're this one. There's no like in-between half wavelength. It's either visible light or boom, ultra ultraviolet light, or, or like green or, you know, this type of, this, this uh, this different shade of it. There's no in-between, you just go in these fixed amounts. Um, he's gonna argue that uh, light is a particle and a wave at the same time. So it's a wave of energy, but it's also like a physical thing, like a particle. It's both, he called them photons uh, and a wave. This was known as, uh, and here's one of his major theories, was a uh, 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 I say this particle wave duality or particle wave yeah, duality. All right, this particle wave duality believes that light itself acts like is a particle, but also acts like a wave at the same time, which is really hard to imagine. Uh, and it's, this is, these are all very counterintuitive ideas. It's really hard to actually picture these in your head. Uh, and as I as I explained further along, probably poorly, but as I explained further along. Um, they're going to actually make sense, but it's still really hard to grasp, uh, to, to understand what they actually mean. So particle wave duality, uh, he's going to assert that, like uh, Max Planck um, asserted before, but, but couldn't necessarily prove, other than uh, having a mathematical constant that fit. He'd say, yeah, uh, light is actually a particle and a wave. It's both, uh, depending on uh, the situation, which we'll get into later. Uh, but what he's going to say is, Yes, it's particle and it's wave, and it's also, light is both, but it's also is packaged in uh, fixed amounts. And that uh, particle and that package are called photons. So that light is, has a specific energy value, <clears throat> and it can only be a range of specific energy values. There's no in between. Uh, and it comes in packages. So there's, uh, 
when a, when a particle, when a light particle comes in, it brings that energy specifically, and it adds that energy specifically. Or when it leaves a, an atom uh, in the form of energy, it's going to take a specific um, uh, package or amount of energy with it. And uh, depending on on that spectrum, on which color it is in visible light, or whether it's infrared or ultraviolet, that's going to be the specific amount. So all particles that have the specific um, amount of energy that's the same as the wavelength for, for UV is, is a UV uh, uh, ray of light, essentially. And if you somehow uh, saw a ray of light that was less energy or more energy, it's a totally different um, uh, value. It's a totally different uh, package. So there's no going between. Like, that's the package of energy that thing brings, and that's it. All right. So it's actually going to be both, which is really, really hard to understand, and hopefully we can explain that better uh, as we progress. So I'm actually going to skip his uh, other two initially, so we can stay on this, this one topic here of uh, particles um, and uh, their existence as both a physical particle, uh, something we conceive as, as matters like an object, but also uh, as a wave, uh, and, and it's going to be both. So I'll come back to his other two major theories uh, in a second, but let's move on. So uh, he asserted this, and again, the math checked out. Uh, so it confirmed Planck's explanation, uh, and it matched up with um, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. And here's how they tested it, too, by the way. So what they found was if they, if they took a metal uh, platform or sheet, and, uh, and they can measure the uh, radioactive activity here, so what it's radiating. If they were to shine, for example, uh, infrared light onto this metal piece, infrared, which is a lower frequency. It didn't matter how many waves of infrared light they did, how intense it was. It could be a million waves of infrared uh, light. That metal did not eject an electron. Or, or, or a photon specifically. Or, or, sorry, an electron specifically. Didn't do it. Didn't matter how many rays of, uh, of, of, this, of this low wavelength that they put on this uh, sheet, it didn't emit any electrons. Didn't happen. But as soon as they took a single, a single ray of UV light, so not intense at all, one single ray of a, of a, of a higher frequency, we'll say UV light, for example, an electron was omitted. And this is actually to confirm that, that uh, it comes in packages, and that it's also both a particle and, and a wave. So because it has a specific value or wavelength, that's going to eject a specific electron. So it's saying, here's a specific amount of energy in a package, and we know that it works, that it's being applied to this metal and then, and then uh, uh, radiated, because we can actually detect the electron leaving. That's the radiation it's emitting. Uh, and they only did one single, um, uh, one single uh, ray of intensity. It didn't matter if you did a million rays of uh, lower intensities, you got zero electrons to come out. And that confirms that, yes, energy does come in specific packages uh, as particles. Because if you add, if you throw in a, a photon at a specific wavelength, it ejects an electron. So it's like, well, electrons are particles as far as they knew. So uh, a wave comes in, a particle comes out. So clearly the uh, light photon is both a particle and a wave as it transmits that energy and out goes an electron. It has to be specific, which again confirms Planck here that it's quantized. It's only in specific amounts. All right, so um, that helped to uh, prove that he was correct. So a uh, metal plate only ejected electron with specific energy packages. So that quantized or quantum uh, theory about uh, energy coming in specific packets that are whole integers um, and that the UV, uh, uh, or sorry, that the waves and the particles were somehow both existing uh, as a state of existence was, was confirmed by this, uh, weirdly enough. And we're going to have some better explanations of that as well. Uh, so that's in 1905 and 1901. Uh, and again, we'll come back to Einstein. But the next series that helped explain this and makes it even weirder, but this is still how it works and how we all work, uh, is, uh, I think his name is Niels Bohr. I might spell his name wrong. Niels Bohr? No. It's German. So if I spell it wrong, sorry, Niels. You're not alive, but sorry I misspelled your first name. Niels Bohr. He's going to actually uh, posit an explanation that, that, that 
confirms or, or at least makes logically sound Einstein's theory. Because like, why would I be able to send a specific photon uh, frequency, a specific energy packet, and out goes an electron. But the other ones, it doesn't do anything. The other infrared light and whatnot, no electrons emitted, but one single UV ray, and out goes that electron. Why is that? Neil Bohr is gonna say, all right, in 1913, <clears throat> how can I phrase this? Electrons, just like light particles, which are also waves, uh, also have specific values. And they orbit the uh, proton, the positively charged particle. So they orbit these protons. Uh, electrons also have specific quantized energy values and orbit at specific distances. So, and this is what's gonna get where it gets uh, weirder. So if you're not confused already, you definitely will be. Um, what he posed <clears throat> is the fact that, so I got a proton here, we'll use, use a hydrogen atom because it's the most simple. Uh, so I got one proton here in the middle. Let's say there's no neutron, it's just a proton. Um, I've got an electron orbiting that, um, so this is positive, that's negative. Uh, it's orbiting this, uh, uh, this proton here. Uh, what he's saying is, since these two things have force, that, that repel one another, uh, the electron can only orbit at a specific distance. So let's say it's this orbit here. I'm gonna tell you why this model actually is incorrect, but nonetheless, it's orbiting here around this proton. Um, it can only orbit, orbit directly there um, in specific integers. So if I add energy, like let's say I add a, uh, a photon of light at a specific energy uh, level, uh, it could, if it's the perfect amount, move this electron um, to a different orbit uh, than this one here. So let's say right here, um, they have, it's, it's just a, it's a low energy uh, hydrogen atom. Let's say I add a, a UV ray in this case, and here it comes, right? So it's gonna be a photon, which is also a wave somehow, so a particle and a wave. Here it comes in, and it's the perfect amount that would add energy to this electron, charge it, and move it to a different specific orbit. So there it goes, it moves to that different orbit. It moves from that one to that one. Pop, there it goes, it moved. Actually, I should probably keep this. Let's see, there it is. So if I add a, a specific amount of energy, it has to be the perfect amount uh, to move the electrons from exactly this uh, orbit to exactly this orbit. If it's any different, if it's uh, a little bit more or a little bit less, nothing's gonna happen. Uh, the electron won't respond to it. The energy won't move or change the behavior of that electron. But if it's the perfect amount, if it's the exact amount of energy that the electron needs to go to the next uh, orbital level, it'll, it'll move. But even weirder than it just moving is it will actually experience what they later characterize as a quantum leap. I think he called it a quantum jump, but we'll just say quantum leap for now. It won't move from one orbit to the other because it can't inhabit this space at all. Uh, instead of it going physically from here to here, right, so like for example, let's say this is the electron, right, and go to this orbit, you're like, oh, move, so it just goes like this. It's like, nope, actually, here's what happens. It can't do this because it can't inhabit this between space. So what happens is to move from here to here, it stops existing here and then pops and exists here. It doesn't go between. It'd be like if I threw a ball and I'm trying to throw it in the next room and I chuck it, it's gonna hit this wall. It can't inhabit the space between this wall. So there'd be no way for me to move this pen into the next uh, classroom. This would be similar to me uh, having this pen, adding the right amount of energy and all of a sudden this marker disappears and reappears in the next room. It doesn't go through the wall, it just appears over there. Uh, that's what the behavior of electrons uh, are, and that's what they do. So, if I have the correct uh, specific amount of energy that it comes in the form of a, a photon, right, this light wave uh, entity, and it's the perfect amount, it will actually uh, be absorbed and move the electron to a different orbital uh, uh, distance. But it can't be any distance. It can't be in this distance anywhere, this or any other. It's got to be that specific amount. Uh, and since it can't exist here, it ceases to exist here, 
and then exists now in that field. Later on, when this uh, uh, charged now uh, atom, an electron, uh, has this energy, later on when it releases energy, it's going to go from this orbital plane back to this one. Uh, so you might be asking, okay, well, how does it go down? Well, it, it does randomly lose energy, but when it loses energy, it is going to mimic uh, what this um, uh, metal plate um, sort of demonstrated. Now, they, they were adding energy here, but let's, let's for sake of argument talk about just when this loses energy and the electron moves back down. Uh, it does just move on its own. If it does this, it's going to radiate. So it's going to move back down. So it goes, ceases existing here, it loses energy, and now it exists at this lower orbital region. Uh, but that's not it. When it moves, it's going to radiate energy. And, you're, and if you're asking yourself, how does it radiate energy? It sends out a photon of light. That's the radiation, right? You're, that's how we see um, these uh, electromagnetic um, waves coming out from objects. It's radiating energy. It's literally, um, um, sending out or omitting um, electrons uh, to do that. So there are photons, rather, to do that. So out goes the photon, uh, and it's in the form of an electromagnetic uh, uh, wave on the electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, if you are uh, remembering before, it took a specific one to go in and move it from there to there. The same thing applies in the reverse. If I'm going to move back down, the only thing that can be omitted is the exact amount of energy difference. So if a, let's say a UV ray went in to move it from there to there, out would be radiated a UV ray of the exact same um, wavelength. So out would go that, um, that uh, photon, and let's say this happened to be the wavelength was on the UV part of the spectrum. So uh, that's the only thing that can move it. So let's say, for example, again, I throw an infrared ray in here, and it hits that, nothing's going to happen. So there's my infrared. Sorry, nothing happened. But I change it to the correct wavelength, which in, in our made-up scenario here happens to be a UV ray. There it goes. Boom. That electron ceases to exist in this orbital plane. It inhabits now a uh, higher energy plane. And um, it stays that way. It doesn't go between. It can't exist here. So it literally stops appearing here and reappears there. And when it gives off energy later, and it goes right back to the other plane, uh, out goes a uh, equal... Uh, uh, energy UV ray uh, or photon, which is both, of course, uh, a particle and a, a wave. But it's going to be that exact wavelength because to move, it either absorbs or omits the exact amount of energy, uh, no difference, which is why um, they have the specific uh, light sources and energy sources. All right, <laughs> if that didn't confuse you enough, because that's not enough to explain exactly how it works, and that doesn't actually explain how atoms work either, because if you uh, realize what atoms are, they're actually just energy, and that's part of what Einstein discovers, and we'll, and we'll go back to that. But it's not like there's an actual solid thing to touch. It's actually the fact that this electron is existing around this photon in the form of a, of a particle and a wave just like uh, photons are. It's going to be sort of everywhere in this orbital range at once, and that's what makes it feel like it's solid. It's almost like it's popping in and out of existence or orbiting so quickly that there's no way to get in or between uh, those, those spaces, essentially. So it, it appears solid, even though it's not. Uh, and since it's moving and reacting with this energy, it's really going to be uh, just energy. So what's going to happen is, I forget his name, was it um, De Broglie? De Broglie? It's, it's French. This guy's coming in later. Uh, I think his name is De Broglie. If I'm spelling it wrong, sorry. Uh, he's the one that's going to discover, I think, that, um, what was it looking for? That circumference he's going to play off a of bore uh, is that wavelength. So actually, I'm going to skip him. I'm going to go right to uh, um, the next person, which is going to be um, Heidegger, who's going to uh, assert that, yes, it is a particle uh, and a wave, but we can't actually know exactly where it is in that um, um, that sphere of the atom. So uh, two guys are both contribute to this. Heisenberg. This is more a period four thing, but I'll at least briefly describe it here. Uh, Schrodinger. Uh, they are going to. I can't remember if there's an N or in his name or not. Schro, Schrodinger or Schrodinger. Schrodinger sounds more right, but there might not be an N there. Uh, so Schrodinger uh, and Heisenberg are both contribute to this. And I'm not going to get super specific because uh, 
we're already getting pretty complex and specific here, but what they're gonna find out is that uh, electrons actually behave the exact same way as these uh, photons do. That electrons themselves, electrons also, uh, wave and particle. So they both share this wave-particle duality uh, like photons do. Um, but they have specific orbits, and uh, these orbits are not planetary. So the reason, so it's helpful to, to, to visualize it, but this is not how uh, atoms actually, or electrons actually behave. So again, if I have that proton here, and I have that electron orbiting to, to form what seems like a, a, um, a solid surface, it's not orbiting like a planet does, like in a circle. It doesn't do that. It actually, and this is weird, um, it exists as a wave all around um, the uh, uh, proton in all locations at once. This is why quantum uh, mechanics gets so uh, really weird, is this electron exists as a wave at a specific wavelength, right, depending on the uh, 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 tier of orbit it is. So if I added a specific amount of energy and move it up to the second level, it would cease to exist here and then cease to exist at the next tier um, as, as, a, as a wave. Uh, and basically it's appearing uh, and vibrating in that specific orbit so quickly um, and everywhere at once that, again, it appears as if it is a solid surface, even though it is actually not. It's just energy that's really condensed and moving around very quickly, orbiting and appearing and existing and re-existing and, and ceasing to exist in one specific orbit over and over uh, that actually makes that atom appear as if it exists. So uh, orbits are not, um, uh, did I put arbitrary there? Are not, oh, planetary. That's what I put, planetary but rather uh, form more of like a, a wave-like uh, cloud of probability. In fact, you can never know exactly where the electron is. You can only know where it is if you measure it for a second. But as soon as you measure it, it's in a different location. And also, if you're adding energy to observe it, like bouncing photons off of it, you're changing the behavior of the electron as well. Um, so you. The more you know about where it is, the less you know about where and how it's moving. Um, so if you don't interact with it, you don't touch it at all, what these things sort of turn into is this proton um, uh, covered by a cloud of, of probability uh, based on the orbit. So this electron is simultaneously uh, disappearing and reappearing in the form of a wave uh, surrounding this entire atom and making it feel like a solid surface. So if I were to take a picture image of where it exactly is at a given moment, the probability it's right here is somewhere around 90%. It could be maybe uh, behaving slightly differently in a different exact area. But um, when I measure exactly where it is, uh, it is no longer in that location anymore. Uh, so if I measure again, now it's over here. Oh, now it's over here. When I measure it the third time, I measure it the fourth time, oh, now it's over here. So it's constantly moving, but it seems like this uh, solid cloud the whole time that I take an instant image and there it is uh, and I do that if I did that like thousands of times it would essentially form exactly what my uh, probability is on where to exactly locate it and that's kind of how atoms work and what gets even weirder and I'm not going to go too into this is if they don't always form perfect circles depending on which uh, uh, a tier or level it exists in so we've got a proton here and let's say I go to uh, different uh, phases these uh, uh, electrons can't inhabit the same um, uh, exact same patterns. They can both, they're going to be two in one level if they're uh, uh, rotating opposite, but if they have the same plane of existence, then they, they cease to exist. So um, it can be the, the standard circular shell, but you can also have these weird ones where like here's the proton, and the electron cloud is actually like this, uh, um, these two clouds that are squeezed tightly uh, next to it and around it. Uh, you can also have ones that break off into like what almost look like balloons. Um, so there's the X and Y axis, but you'd also have this third 3D axis, like a Z behind it. Uh, and you can get some really weird shapes on how these electrons interact. It'd be, again, it'd be like if you took four balloons and tied it all to one point, they would uh, fit into a specific uh, arrangement, just, just like the electrons actually do. But they do get pretty weird too, like sometimes you get these weird uh, shapes like this, where here's the proton and uh, the electron cloud is like, well, like a hula hoop around it in one in one orbital um, plane, and then they have these two balloon-like ones. So there's the electron existing here, and another one existing here, another one existing here. 
uh, and that actually forms what seems like a, a solid surface. Um, so that's, that's the weird existence um, of electrons that just totally shattered our understanding. So first of all, um, they are quantized, they are specific for some reason. And also, uh, since they're so small, they're actually going to exist as a wave and a particle. Um, I can't remember which, which quantum uh, physicist it was that discovered it, but they actually discovered that um, all things have wavelengths. So we're all acting as a wave, technically. Even me, even you, even the Earth is technically acting as a wave, but the bigger you are, the smaller your wavelength. So if you're large like us or a planet or something like that, the wave behavior we have is so small it's undetectable. But the smaller you get, since it's inversely related, uh, so what do we put here? Matter is inversely related uh, to, or I should say matter wavelength is inversely related to uh, size. So the bigger you are, the smaller your wavelength. So our wave-like behavior, you don't even notice. Technically we have wave-like behavior in waves, but we're so large, made of trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of atoms that uh, you, you can't even detect it. But if you get small enough down to the smallest thing, which are what they believe like electrons, quarks, and things like that. Um, you're so small uh, that the size of your wave actually matters. So you behaving like a wave and your physical existence, uh, it's unclear um, as to, uh, to which one it is, and it actually ends up being both. Um, so that's what, um, so matter wavelength is, in, is inversely related to its size, uh, and that actually matters at the extremely small, uh, this results, in uh, existence as a particle uh, and wave uh, simultaneously, or, or exuding, exuding both behaviors. So again, technically we are doing this too, but we don't notice it because our wavelength is, is so incredibly minute that it, it, you can't even detect it, but, um, uh, or we can't certainly. But uh, when you're as small as an electron, um, which are many times smaller than even a proton, uh, then uh, it, it does actually matter. So photons, electrons, they're so incredibly small at the extreme, um, like inconceivably small to us, that they uh, exist as waves uh, and particles. In fact, they believe that that consistent wave pattern and that inhabiting of that uh, space as a wave, um, that actually is existence. So we don't actually exist as things, we are actually just waves of energy. And that actually brings me back to uh, Einstein again. So how I would sum this up is, why, why do we care about this? We learned that um, by, through all these discoveries, uh, that atoms were not the smallest particles. And in fact, there exists a quantum realm that is so ridiculous and abstract and beyond our understanding. Um, and it, 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 there is no subjective or objective existence to it. These electrons and photons exist as particles and waves. Their behavior uh, is erratic and it's fixed for some reason. And uh, we can never truly measure it accurately. In fact, by trying to measure it, um, by using these rays of light that are small enough to actually interact with the electrons, we actually charge them and change their behavior. So even looking at them isn't exactly what they're doing. Uh, we can possibly uh, never know exactly. So <clears throat> that's wave-particle duality. So we discover, of course, that we are uh, not solid objects, but we are also uh, waves at the core, uh, eventually. And uh, of course, Planck and Einstein are the ones that start that value. Uh, but let's go. Let's bring us to our next uh, major discovery here by Einstein. Is that actually, and this will be confirmed later, more specifically by others, energy itself is uh, what matter actually is. Um, so that's going to take uh, your mass, whatever it is. Uh, so your, your atoms, your existence as an atom, um, times the constant square. This constant, by the way, is the speed of light which is going to be important for the, the third category we talk about here. What this equation means is you and your existence uh, as, a, as a massive unit, as actual matter itself, um, you are, like I mentioned before, actually just a whole bunch of, um, of vibrations and waves. You're, you're a whole bunch of energy condensed uh, to form a very, very, very uh, small uh, what appears to be a particle. Like the waves are, are moving so incredibly quickly with so much energy that they actually uh, function and behave like a particle, even though they are actually just waves of energy. So this actually is gonna mean that uh, you are actually, your atoms are all just energy, essentially. It's just really, really compact energy. And the reason why I know it's compact is this number squared 
constant is the speed of light. That's, uh, is it 330 million? I can't remember if it's 30 or 300 million. I think it's 30 million. Maybe it's 30. We'll say it's 30 million. 30 million, um, or 300. 30 million meters per second. That's the speed of light. So in a, in a second, they've gone 300 million meters. That's just, I think it's like 189,000 miles or something like that, which is probably somewhere close to uh, 350,000 kilometers or something like that uh, per second. <clears throat> um, regardless, uh, what it's, what it's going to mean is, um, it'll be close to three, 300,000 kilometers, but whatever. Whatever it is, um, it's insanely fast. So this number, whatever this is going to be, uh, is going to be an insanely high number. Uh, so you're like, well, who cares? What does that mean? We're made of energy? All right, that's abstract, weird enough. But um, what this actually means is to make your mass of an atom, it takes a tremendous amount of energy to do so because the speed of light squared is an insanely high number. Um, so this basically means that, okay, atoms and you are actually just a bunch of uh, moving particles uh, that are actually waves, such as uh, electrons. Uh, and furthermore, it takes a tremendous amount of energy to corral those to uh, be fixed in one location and act as, as, as a particle by making these waves that move so consistently in all, all locations at once seem like what is a physical surface uh, that if you were to somehow break that, um, that energy that bound itself to act as, as a solid surface or a particle as a wave, if you broke that and released that energy, even from a single atom, it's going to be a tremendous uh, amount of energy that's going to be released. Uh, and that's exactly what they're going to find out. This is what's going to essentially lead to the uh, nuclear age. Nuclear age. So again, let me recap. This asserts that energy is actually the equivalent of uh, just uh, your mass times the speed of light squared. So if we were to somehow release that, even a single atom, is a tremendous amount of energy. If we were to somehow release that by splitting it and then releasing uh, neutrons or other uh, uh, charged particles as energy, it would be an insanely large amount. And that's exactly what those uh, first um, atomic bombs were uh, on, uh, that were dropped on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They were essentially just taking a neutron, thrusting it into a, uh, an unstable uh, uranium atom, or a bunch of them. So it splits it, and what they do is they add an, a neutron and when they split it and release it, uh, the way that the uh, two uh, pro byproducts, and I forget what they are, I think it's like, is it krypton and bromium? I can't remember what the two, the two components are, but they, when they break it up, this uranium, and it becomes two new elements, they're left with these extra particles, these neutron particles that have a bunch of energy. So those just go flying outwards as energy, uh, and it's really just an explosion. And because those go out, they put a bunch of other uranium uh, particles uh, in there, atoms in there. So those neutrons go flying out, uh, three of them. So one goes in and three go out, and then they split more uranium uh, uh, atoms into those other two uh, uh, atoms. And it releases just more and more and more and more and more neutrons, and then all of a sudden, you have this insanely large release of energy because they split a bunch of atoms all at once. Uh, and so all of a sudden, you have this massive explosion that emits an insane amount of, 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 of high, um, high frequency energy, uh, you know, gamma rays and all that, uh, towards the uh, cosmic ray end of the spectrum, which is super high energy, uh, which is just going to absolutely destroy anything that, that comes across. And that's exactly what happens. That's why this atomic bomb was so much more devastating than any other, uh, you know, chemical explosion that we can, that we can create. Um, uh, so that, that's essentially what that's going to be. Um, so all of those, those, those chemical bonds that we're breaking, which is what essentially explosives are, uh, we're actually going beyond the chemical bond. We're going to the actual uh, bond of the atom itself, which is uh, insanely high in uh, amounts of energy. And they go be beyond that, by the way, when they figure out the hydrogen bond, which is uh, different. So this is actually what's called um, fission, when you're splitting atoms, split atoms, and it releases a bunch of energy. They actually found out, though, that to create far more energy is to fuse atoms together uh, and, and throw out uh, uh, particles um, uh, and energy that way. Uh, so a hydrogen bomb is essentially when they use this device, they set off a chemical explosion, which activates an atomic explosion, which inside of itself, of course, uh, breaks all these atoms. Let me try to make a graph. Or, or a drawing of it. It basically just uh, uh, takes chemical explosives, so like standard things like you know dynamite or whatever, 
uh, puts them uh, surrounding a bunch of uh, uh, uranium, nuclear fusion. So that explodes, which then uh, splits these atoms in the uranium, which creates an atomic explosion, which then, and I can't remember the specifics on how it works, there's like a plutonium rod in with this, uh, with this uh, certain powder. Uh, I can't remember what the compound is, but nonetheless, what this does is it sets off that atomic explosion, which then creates a tremendous amount of energy and pressure and heat and throws together um, several um, unstable uh, particles and fuses them by just smashing them together energy and it releases the, uh, the excess um, uh, energy that was <clears throat> um, uh, uh, a result of the creation of these uh, hydrogen uh, or these helium uh, atoms that are created by fusing the hydrogen and out go those extra electrons and, or, and uh, neutrons and that's gonna equal uh, an explosion that I just made the sound of for some reason. Uh, that's like, uh, was it 10,000 times more powerful than the atomic bomb? It's, it's something, it's another degree of magnitude up. Uh, it's ridiculously more powerful than the basic atomic bomb. So they use uh, fission, which is splitting atoms, to cause atoms to actually uh, combine uh, for fusion. Equals combine atoms. So that takes a lot of energy, but uh, depending on the uh, atoms that you are using and their charges um, and their uh, stability, the presence of, of, of neutrons essentially, um, fusing them can actually release even more energy. In fact, that's what's going on in the sun right now. That's what's radiating all these cosmic gamma rays and heat that, that, that come down and of course the, our ozone deflects the, the dangerous gamma cosmic and um, uh, largely uh, x-rays uh, with some UVs getting through, which is why you gotta wear uh, um, sunblock and, and whatnot to avoid the burning and damaging of your DNA tissue. Um, but uh, uh, that's what's actually creating all of these, uh, oh, as I said, fission twice, fusion. That's what's actually happening is the sun has got so much energy and, and gravity, uh, gravitational force pushing down all these hydrogen and helium uh, atoms that it's actually fusing them together and releasing uh, in the form of energy all of these rays out that we are collecting living off of. So we have the ozone and we're getting hit by the cosmic rays and the, the x-rays and the um, gamma rays. Uh, the cosmic gamma rays would just totally burn us and disintegrate us uh, completely. The x-rays and EV rays would too, but since most of those are blocked out by interactions with our electromagnetic field uh, and our ozone layer, only some of those rays get through. <clears throat> and um, if you are out in the UV, uh, getting too much UV radiation, it basically gets in and causes your, uh, uh, it essentially adds in energy and breaks apart some of your unstable molecules in your DNA. So your DNA gets screwed up and then you get cancer and, and, and die from that. But uh, that's, that's essentially what equals mc squared represent is that actually uh, this park wave duality, which uh, embodied light was later also connected to electrons. Uh, and that's basically what it says that all mass and, and matter for that matter are uh, actually just energy. And if you, it takes a tremendous amount of energy to get them to act like these particles uh, as waves. And if you release that, you get a tremendous amount of energy uh, by splitting them and releasing it or by combining them and splitting out the excess um, <clears throat> particles and waves. So those are the first uh, two. So they're gonna absolutely demolish the understanding uh, about how uh, the world works, or the universe works at the, at the tiniest level. Uh, it gets incredibly complicated. In fact, there isn't actually physical substance. All of our existence is actually just a bunch of, of, of waves. So that really, that really challenged people's understanding of classical mechanics. So this whole explanation for light is a wave out, uh, our traditional expl explanation for how the electromagnetic spectrum function is out because we now realize it's quantized. And then atoms we now know are not particles. They're made up of smaller particles that are actually not particles. It's just uh, uh, waves of energy. And to bind those together to seem like particles and seem like they have a physical surface takes a tremendous amount of energy. And if you find a way to release that, uh, manipulating these elements you can't even see, uh, that you, it's impossible to see for the most part, um, you uh, uh, release a tremendous amount of energy. So that definitely shook our understanding of the world. Um, and, and, and challenged it. But probably the one that challenged the idea we could objectively understand the world and all the universal laws and how it works the most was actually Einstein's theories about uh, relativity, specifically um, what we call special relativity. 
because it's dealing with uh, like what we're doing with here, the extremes. So for relativity, we're gonna talk about the extremely fast, like near light speed, and they're also gonna, we're also talking about the extremely small here, like with the, with the quantum realm, uh, and electrons and particles and waves, um, but also um, uh, size too, as far as e extremely large. So depending on your speed and your size, whether it's quantum or it's extremely massive, like supermassive stars and, and, and that collapse into black holes and all this and all that, uh, super, super, super massive size, or you're talking quantum level uh, uh, tininess, uh, the rules change completely uh, in a way that is abstract and we, we, can't, we can barely comprehend um, and is fundamental. Uh, but also that it's uh, gonna be subjective to the observer and that person's experience, uh, which I'll talk about now as I make room for um, special relativity. So aside from bringing existence into question, another thing that, um, uh, as far as how we exist and objects being real and solid and being uh, uh, waves and all of that and, and specific quanta for energy and all of those, those uh, uh, characteristics of quantum mechanics. Um, on the larger scale, <clears throat> Einstein's going to come up with, uh, this is his third one, it's probably the most obvious uh, breaker of ob objectivity and, 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 uh, and you know, having one solid answer for all times and places and speeds, is he's going to uh, discover what we, or, or theorize what we call special relativity. So it's still in 1905, it's still Einstein. Um, and he's going to, of course, come up with the theory, um, which we call now special relativity. Special because, uh, relativity. Uh, special because it's only applicable in special circumstances <clears throat> of extremely high mass or extremely high gravity or extremely fast speeds. Um, and then of course the quantum, not that it's a relativity, but the quantum stuff is also the extreme with the, with the small. So Einstein, 95 special relativity. This is, this is two things, <clears throat> but uh, I can kind of explain it in one. Um, time and space, so time being of course like the actual passage of time and how things go about and decay and all of that. So time and then space, the actual area that we inhabit whether it's like on a planet or actually in uh, space itself in the vacuum, which is also not a vacuum, but um, uh, time and space are, uh, are actually relative themselves, are relative to the observer. <clears throat> and I don't mean, relative by the way means, uh, it, it's like it's saying it depends uh, compared to something else. Uh, relative um, being like, oh, uh, what's an example? Oh, um, I'm strong as an adult, or any, uh, for the most part, any, any adult is. Uh, a male is strong relative to uh, a baby, right? So maybe as an adult, uh, I or whoever's individual isn't actually strong. Maybe you're actually quite weak compared to other adults, but compared to a baby, you are quite strong. Maybe that baby is pretty strong compared to the babies, but compared to an adult, they're not going to be strong. So relative, uh, the term itself means like compared to something else. So again, uh, an adult is, rel is strong relative to uh, an infant, uh, but you know, you could also be strong relative to other adults or weak relative to other adults. So um, <clears throat> basically time and space depend on the actual observer. Um, we don't notice this at our size and our speed, uh, whether we're going 100,000 miles an hour or whether we're, uh, you know, just moving with the planet and the solar system <clears throat> and the galaxy, uh, we aren't moving fast enough to notice this, but it's actually occurring. So um, what was in his uh, equation before that we talked about e equals mc squared, the c, the constant. The constant that Einstein is going to refer to here is uh, the c in e, e equals mc squared. Constant uh, equals that speed of light, which you mentioned before, speed of light. Uh, which is at either either 300 million or, or 30 million, I think it's 30 million, but uh, 30 million uh, meters per second. That speed is uh, constant as in it never changes. And it doesn't matter, that's the only thing um, that I'm aware of anyway, um, in Einstein's theories of, of physics, is that that's the only thing that doesn't change ever. So this this speed of light. So what I mean by that is this. That's the speed. <clears throat> Uh, 100 or, or 30 million miles or uh, meters per second, but um, so, but that doesn't make sense because 
what if you're traveling really fast? Wouldn't light be your speed minus the uh, speed of light? Because like, for example, if I'm standing still, <clears throat> I'm on the observer A, there's me, I got a radar gun, uh, and a car drives by, there's the bad car, uh, and it's driving uh, on a road, or I'm on the sidewalk. Wait, no, that's, here's the sidewalk I'm on. There's the road. Well, it changed the direction of this car a little bit. There we go. So there's a car going down the road. If I'm standing still, still, at least my version of still, I'm still moving with the planet, but let's assume that our resting point is zero, right? So I realize the planet's moving, the solar system, the galaxy are moving, but right here, me standing still seems like still to me. There's the relativity thing again, because I'm not actually standing still, the planet's moving, but nonetheless. I'm standing still on the Earth. You're on the Earth too. Uh, you're in a car and you're driving 100 miles an hour. Well, you're gonna take it, but uh, that's what uh, speed you are uh, to me, essentially. But what if uh, uh, you somehow safely are a passenger, uh, put your arm out the window and threw a baseball 50 miles an hour uh, from that car? Uh, I wouldn't radar that as 50 miles an hour, and I wouldn't radar it as 100 miles an hour. I'd have to combine the two. Right, so if you're moving 100 miles an hour and you throw a baseball 50, uh, if I radar the baseball itself, uh, that would be 150 miles per hour. So you would think, oh, so light, it's uh, whatever speed I'm traveling subtracted from the speed of light. And you would think that's how it works. Let's take the car example again. Uh, let's say this car is, uh, wow, that's a really misshapen car. Uh, that car's driving down the road and uh, turns on his, uh, his headlights, and boop, there goes my photons right out. There they go. Shouldn't that be the 30 million uh, mile, uh, uh, meters per second minus the 100 miles an hour of my car? That's what it should be, you would think, but it's actually not. It doesn't matter if you're going 100 miles an hour or zero miles an hour or 100 million miles an hour. Uh, to the person that's here, or anywhere actually, the speed of light is exactly the same. It's constant. Nothing else um, can change it. That's how it moves in a vacuum. Uh, it doesn't matter if I'm moving super fast or not moving at all, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, register the same speed for the speed of light. So it doesn't matter if I'm going 99% of the speed of light, uh, whatever that be, uh, you know, what would that be? Like 297 or something like that? Uh, or yeah, something like that. Whatever it is, 99% of uh, 30 million, which I can't do in my head right now. Uh, if I was nine, moving 99% 99 that speed, <clears throat> and I turned on a flashlight and sent off a beam of light that way, uh, it wouldn't be the speed of light plus 99% of the speed of light. It would just still be the exact same uh, uh, of that constant speed. So, what does that mean? <clears throat> that means nothing can go faster than the speed of light, first of all because the speed of light is the fastest thing. It's like the, the speed limit. Uh, so what he's gonna discover here is that since the speed of light is constant and your, your speed is basically um, the distance you travel uh, times the uh, time it takes you to travel, that's what your speed is essentially. If this can't change, because normally you'd be like, oh, well, if I, if I ran 100 meters in uh, one hour, then I'm running 100, meter, 100 meters an hour. That's my speed. But for light, this can't change. It's constant. So if I'm moving really fast, uh, you know, on Earth or off of Earth, a spaceship, whatever it is, no matter what, I observe uh, the speed of light the same. So if this doesn't change, then the only thing that has to change that can change are distance and time those actually change uh, for the observer. Uh, and this is the thing that just absolutely blows people's mind about special relativity is, <clears throat> if I am traveling close, now this doesn't, this doesn't uh, happen noticeably if you're moving really fast but you're nowhere near the speed of light. Um, so exact, for all the stuff I'm gonna describe, it actually happens to us uh, by moving or not moving, even in planes and cars and things like that. But it's so tiny, we don't notice it. Um, but unless you're moving close to speed of light, like 80% or, 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 or 90% or basically 80% above uh, or, or somewhere between 80% uh, and 99% of the speed of light, 
is where you start noticing these things. <clears throat> so what this means is how we perceive space and distance and length and how we perceive time is actually subjective to the actual observer. So here's what I mean by that. <clears throat> if I was here on Earth, let's say I got a twin, twin, right? There's me and my twin, and we're on Earth. Obviously, this isn't to scale. Uh, but we're on Earth. Uh, if I were to say, okay, cool, well, um, one twin wants to go to, uh, you know, uh, some, uh, some location in space, I don't know, let's say uh, one of the nearer stars, and they go, okay, uh, and they uh, create a uh, spaceship for it. Here's the spaceship. It's going to be a bad spaceship. We'll just do like a standard rocket looking thing. There we go. So there we go. He's going to go in the spaceship. So here's twin A, here's twin B. Uh, twin A stays on Earth. Twin B hops on that rocket ship. Obviously, it be in it, but I don't know if we want it. B. All right, so there you go. So there goes the rocket ship, and let's say it's going 80% uh, um, uh, the speed of light. So it's going very quickly. Okay, so it's going quickly, uh, and it goes, and uh, let's say that uh, the trip to get to the star uh, takes um, uh, there six months. Obviously, it's gonna take longer than that, but we're just keeping it simple-ish. Uh, and then uh, and it takes six months to uh, come back. So it's going to be a, a year-round trip uh, for this person right here. When they go, um, well, actually, let's make it more simple. Let's say it's uh, six years each way. Six years. Not six months. No, we'll make it ten. I just keep changing it. Uh, so five years and five years. All right, so it's a ten-year-round trip for, for this person here. Um, I think this is the way the math plays out. If that person got onto that rocket ship, went 80% of the speed of light, going super, super fast, five-year trip uh, to that star, five-year trip back, when, it, when, it, when he arrives, you would think, right, that uh, person A and person B, the twins, would be uh, the same age, right? Especially if they're identical twins, they should look exactly the same. But that's actually not what happens. When this person goes on the 10-year trip at 80% at of the, uh, the speed of light, they come back, and let's say they were 40, when they uh, started this, 40 years old. So uh, this guy's gonna come back and he's gonna be 50. So B is gonna be 50 years old. <clears throat> but what actually is gonna happen is person A is not 50 years old. Person A is going to be 60, what is it? I think it's 66.7 years old, if I remember correctly. My, my, my remembering the uh, ratio for uh, one year at 80% light speed, I think it's one to 1 1.67. I, I might be uh, misremembering that. Regardless, even if my numbers are off here, the person coming back is gonna come back younger than the person who stayed on Earth. And that, to people, is just absolutely mind-boggling. Um, and this is actually true. They've actually tested this, um, not with this specific example, but they've test tested those other speeds and devices and atomic clocks, like our satellites, for example, that are out there flying very, very quickly around the, uh, the Earth, uh, they actually have to adjust the time um, uh, for this, this, this time discrepancy because what happens when you're moving that close to the speed of light, <clears throat> since the speed of light itself can't change, like it's constant, uh, for it to maintain that exact same speed to this observer here, observer B, their time has to slow relative to uh, uh, another person, essentially. Uh, it also has got to contract their space, which, which we'll get to. This is called time dilation. And you're like, what does that even mean? So what, what, what you would think is either this person's life went in fast forward or this person's life went in slow motion, but it actually doesn't. This person, the 16.7 uh, years that went by, it was just a normal 16.7 years to them. Uh, they just went about their lives. It seemed normal. They came back, and then their, their brother or whatever twin uh, is going to come back, and he's going to be uh, considerably younger. All right, so 10 years for him will be 16.7 for the twin that stayed on Earth. So he's going to come back and be like, what? How are you 50 and I'm 66.7? That would actually uh, blow his mind. Well, he wouldn't because he would know the math, but let's assume they didn't know about this phenomenon. They'd come back and be shocked uh, that uh, one was significantly older um, than the other. 
So, oh, I did the math wrong. You need 56.7. My bad. 56.7. So all of you early in the video are like, no, that's not what it was. I put the wrong number. Uh, 56.7. So 10 years for him would be 16.7 uh, for um, uh, person A. So that's what would happen when they come back. They came back, and that's, that's incredibly uh, weird uh, and counterintuitive to us, but that's actually what goes. So to make sure that that speed stays constant, uh, two things have to happen. Time and uh, space have to change uh, to maintain that constant speed. So his time slows down, and also his distance is gonna shrink, which I'll get into next. But what I want you to know is the people that are on these trips, the guy in the spaceship and the guy on Earth, time seems exactly the same to them. But realistically, what's happening is it's actually going slower time for this guy than it is for that guy. So if he were to somehow be able to observe him, it'd basically be him in slow motion. And he, if he were able to observe back somehow at Earth, it would appear to him to be moving quicker. Uh, this is the crazy thing that they, they talk about. The same phenomena happens when gravity is super, super intense. It slows time down. Um, so I've, I've, I've heard from some of the astrophysicists um, in videos that I've watched, if you'd be sucked into a black hole or go past the event horizon and you were facing outwards towards space, not the black hole, um, you would experience this time slowing, but time outside uh, of your range would, would go at a faster rate, just like it is in this, in this uh, example. So if you were to fall backwards into a black hole, what you'd actually see is the whole universe go and like fast more work, uh, more work, fast forward while uh, you were, of course, just falling eventually to your, to your death as the black hole tore all your atoms apart and combined it with its singularity. But that's what a time dilation is. So if I've got really intense gravity or I'm moving at a very, very fast speed, most notably above 80% light speed or more, time moves slower for me. But when I'm in it, when I'm at this speed, I don't notice it, it seems the same to me. But when I come back to somebody who had a different speed, like they're moving at just whatever the speed of our Earth is moving, it's not gonna be uh, the same, uh, even though they experienced the time uh, the same way. Theirs is moving faster than their time. But you don't notice it when you're in it. You can only notice it when you're relative uh, to somebody else. So they'll come back and be younger than the twin uh, who stayed here. Um, so yeah, that's the crazy part. And if you're wondering like, nah, that doesn't happen to us. It actually does. But since we're not anywhere near this speed or anywhere near like those super gravitational um, uh, levels, we just don't notice it. But it's actually true. If you were to uh, take a, a plane flight around the world um, and go quicker than most people, you actually do technically experience time slightly more slowly, like billionths of a second, so you would never notice it, but it actually does happen. So if you go at the extremely fast speeds, um, uh, as they preach light, approach light speed, uh, then you actually start noticing it. So it's just like the quantum. So this is obviously uh, the extreme of speed. The quantum uh, realm is the extreme of size. Uh, so that's when the uh, rules get really, really weird. Um, uh, you know, like how we all have wave-like behavior, but we can't tell. But if you get to a small enough particle, you can actually, it, it begins to interfere with your perception of the particle. Uh, if it even is a particle, it's most likely just the wave itself. But nonetheless, this is the same idea. So if you go super fast, you'll notice it. But if you're, if you're just going the speeds we're going, which are not approaching the speed of light by any means, uh, we're not going to notice it. Um, and if you just go a thousand miles an hour faster for a while, you're still not going to be billions of a second. But they do have to adjust <clears throat> satellites for that because the satellites go around the world in just a matter of, of, of is it 90 minutes or something like that? Something really, really, really fast. Um, so even though it is just, you know, billions of a second, uh, over time that actually does make a difference in their digital clock. So they have to account for that and they actually adjust those satellites uh, to uh, account for that time difference with us on Earth because they have slightly less gravity, uh, gravitational uh, pull on them because they're a little further away from the center of the Earth and they're also uh, moving quite a bit faster than us. So that tiny difference has to be accounted for. Uh, but that is confirmable. And what's even weirder as well is not only did this time dilation thing, but also, and this is really hard to uh, comprehend, the observer here on, uh, on the Earth, if they could look up and see this person flying their spaceship uh, that's going by at 80% of, of light speed, the space they occupy, since again, uh, your speed, according to the Newtonian laws, equals uh, uh, time, times distance, 
Uh, since this can't change, the speed of light, um, and this is constant, the thing that actually changes uh, is the time, which we discussed here, time dilation, but the distance changes too. So to account for this uh, uh, change here, time slows down, but also length contracts. So you don't notice it, especially from the side, you can't notice from the side, but, or sorry, um, uh, 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 horizontally you don't notice it. So like if you're looking straight at the person, they'll look the same, but they actually, the direction that they're moving, if the rocket's going this way, this, this portion of them actually shrinks to account for that. So if you're standing looking at me from the direction I'm traveling, you won't notice anything. But if you're to the side of me, you'll notice that it's actually slightly shorter. So this whole rocket ship, actually to this observer, would shrink uh, in the direction that they're accelerating. So it would actually go from you know something that's about this long uh, to something that is uh, actually much shorter. So you're like, what? They get sardined and then they die in there? No, actually, if you're in the rocket ship, it seems the exact same to you. Uh, the uh, space you inhabit seems the same, but to somebody who's moving, uh, who's stationary, uh, compared to a person moving at 80% or above the speed of light, it actually looks and is smaller uh, for, that, for that moment. And I think Einstein gave the example of like, if you took a 40-foot pole and you moved it at 90% of the speed of light, or 90%, whatever it was, I can't remember the exact number, and you got this pole flying by, and it's 40 feet, um, and you got a 40, or you got a 20-foot barn, Make it actually roughly the same. Here's a barn, a bad barn. Uh, so let's say that's 40 feet, 40 foot pole and a 20 foot barn. If this thing went by at the 99% uh, of the speed of light, there's actually a, a, a moment where you could close these barn, barn doors and fit that 40 foot pole into that 20 foot barn because of the, uh, of the um, uh, length contraction. That's what it's called when, when the space actually shrinks to account for the, uh, the speed difference as you approach the speed of light. So this 40 foot pole, if it was going fast enough, would actually appear to and be actually 20 feet long. So you could shut it in technically for a split second in that 20 foot barn and then continue it out. But if it came down and slowed down to your speed at the stationary speed, you would see it at 40 feet uh, again. So that's the really weird abstract thing. And I know you're right, I know that's, that, that's weird to you with time dilation. So if you're moving really, really, really fast, uh, time moves slower for the observer that's, that's moving at that speed. And uh, for the person that's looking from the outside that's not moving quickly, it appears to go, um, uh, or sorry, if they're looking onto uh, people that aren't moving quickly, it goes quick. But same with the length, it's going to appear to be shorter. And it is actually, but it doesn't change the perception of the person in the spaceship. So if I'm on Earth looking at the spaceship, yeah, it's shorter, but the person on the spaceship, it's just a normal spaceship to them. Um, yeah, it's actually pretty crazy. It also changes what you think of as simultaneous events. So if that same rocket ship was going by and got struck by lightning on both ends, it would be instant to us as the rocket ship's going by. But if I was on the rocket ship, it wouldn't be instantaneous. I would actually see it hit in the front first and then in the back uh, uh, to maintain that, that constant uh, speed of light, which is pretty insane. Uh, so what this really means is with the special relativity and this time dilation and length contraction, uh, it's going to uh, upend uh, Newtonian physics. Now again, Newtonian physics is very reliable and consistent and dependable, and we, we use it all the time, to calculate the movement of large and slow bodies. And, and I, that's relative, of course, the term. I could mean large compared to the atomic level is, you know, a single cell, you know, um, um, depending on the, on the cell itself, um, or uh, some sort of microorganism. That's too small for us to see, but that's still large on the on the scale of quantum uh, mechanics. And uh, uh, slow, you could be going 300,000 miles an hour, but that's still slow compared to the speed of light, so you're not really going to notice it. But as you approach those extremes, the uh, uh, atomic, subatomic level as far as size, uh, or you approach the um, uh, speed of light uh, or gravity that's so massive it, it can actually uh, bend and pull light in, uh, then it's going to be different um, as far as what the observer is going to notice. So it's not universal, it's not objective. Uh, time and space actually warp and change to keep that speed of light constant. In fact, if you get enough gravitational force, which we're talking about, which I mentioned before, like a black hole where you have so much mass that it collapses on itself, you actually lose space and time, 
and they cease to exist. Also, I should mention these photons moving at the speed of light. <clears throat> and here's what's hard to imagine. Since they're going the speed of light, if you get to that speed, uh, time has to go so slow and space has to contract so much to accommodate it, they would cease to exist for uh, that person. So photons, theoretically, as they move uh, throughout the universe, however they do it, uh, there's no time and no speed uh, or in no space to them because space has to contract um, uh, to the point that there isn't any left and time has to slow down to the point that it's not moving to maintain that speed. So the closer you are to the speed of light, the slower time gets and the more your length contracts. And if you reach the speed of light, which you can't, um, then uh, time stops and space cease to, ceases to exist, at least from your, from your, uh, uh, from, from the observer's perspective or, or from, from yours. So uh, that's what's crazy about it. Uh, is uh, you cannot exceed uh, speed of light. And if you do, uh, you actually will stop time uh, and space. The two are connected somehow in some abstract way. And if you move the speed of light, they actually stop. And the closer you get to it, uh, the slower time goes and the, the, the less um, space that they're actually to the point that if you reach it, both stop to cease existing. Uh, so that throws Newtonian physics right out the window as far as being a universal law of objective truth because we now know that your speed uh, and even uh, your, your, your gravitational pull and size all affect how you um, uh, perceive reality, essentially. Uh, and again, even, even us, uh, we do emit tiny waves that we can't notice. Um, when I run or drive a car or anything, I'm technically actually uh, contracting my length, but it's just just fractions of a fraction of a fraction of, a, of an atom in size, so it, we don't notice it. And I also technically slow down time so so much, but it's just billions of a billionth of a second, so I don't even notice uh, those actually occurring. But they do we go to the extremes, and they are noticeable. So that is how Planck and Einstein and Bohr and then later um, Heisenberg and Schrodinger, uh, they're going to completely demolish uh, this idea of objective truth or universal laws uh, in, in Newtonian and classical physics. And they're gonna show that uh, reality is much weirder than we thought at the extremes and that time and space uh, are somehow interconnected, act differently than we think, and their objective uh, existence, or sorry, an objective perception of their existence is, is impossible. It's based on your your speed and your location. And at the quantum level, um, we, are, we are actually just energy waves that are highly condensed, it turns out. So that's how they blew the uh, lid off of Newtonian physics uh, and um, our, our faith in an objective true science and find an objective true answer because it doesn't exist. It depends on your perspectives, whether you're Nietzsche or you're Freud or you're uh, quantum physics and special relativity, uh, we show that there is no objective truth uh, and that um, also, uh, at least the uh, Freud and Nietzsche portion, were driven largely by irrational mechanisms. So this faith in science and this faith in rationality are going to uh, be shaken. They're going to dissipate um, going into the early 20th century. Uh, so again, I do want to remind you, though, don't just abandon all of those Enlightenment ideals uh, based on the scientific method and logic and reason. We can actually use those to benefit our lives quite a bit, and we have been doing that. Uh, but to think that they are the only one solution and that there is one fitting solution to understanding objective truth in the world, uh, there, um, as far as we know, there is not. So that's where uh, 19th century philosophy, science, uh, and psychology leave us. Uh, we will move into period four with those theories. Um, uh, obviously, those of you taking the test this year won't be using those, but uh, next we'll talk about how these ideas uh, and the earlier ideas of the 19th century have played out as far as impacting culture and uh, the arts. And that'll be it for period three.